3D printing in resin is a field which has a lot of accepted wisdom, and it can seem a little daunting when you first come across it, but that doesn't mean it has to be difficult. Whether you're planning on printing your miniatures for use on D&D or other tabletop games, you'll find that printing in resin isn't as daunting as people seem to make it out. So I've teamed up with Anvil Industry to bring you a two-part guide on how you can print your own miniatures at home. From the very beginning of getting your hands on STL files and what that means, to post-processing and getting your printed miniatures on the table ready to be painted. Now Anvil Industry themselves has two ways which you can get your hands on their STL files for printing at home. You can either join up with the Anvil Digital Forge on Patreon, where each month you get a truly enormous set of miniatures. I mean, let's just take a brief look here. <laughs> Everything in one go, and each month a different theme. So there's always going to be something that you'll find interesting. Alternatively, you can visit their main website, where you can either purchase resin miniatures which are cast in the traditional sense, or you can visit their digital forge there, and check out the packs that are available a little after they've been on Patreon. So let's get a look at an STL file. Now STL stands for Stereolithography, and it's a file type which actually dates back to 1987, which I found pretty interesting. It's used in computer-aided design, and it's useful to us in 3D printing because it saves the 3D physical properties of a miniature without any extraneous information like color or texture. We're not going to need that. Now I'm using here 3D Viewer, which is a program that's bundled with Windows 10, but there's a bunch of programs that you can use to view STL files before you get to the printing stage. I just thought it would be useful to get a look at one. Now this is one of the characters from the post-apocalypse set from Anvil. And let's just spin him around here. As you can see, we have all the physical characteristics of our miniature visible, but there's also these strange lattices which are attached to the model. These are called supports, and if you've never come across them before, what these are for is to make sure that as the miniature is coming off of the printer, it has something to stick to. We'll talk about that in a little bit. For now, it's enough to know that not all miniatures are going to come what we call pre-supported. Now Anvil makes sure that most of their miniatures are available pre-supported. They also have an option where you're able to get them without the supports, if you prefer to do that yourself. Personally, I find it a great time saver that they've already put the work into that for me, and I've had a 100% success rate with my prints that way, so I'm happy to let them do the work. Now you don't have to open an STL file and get a look at it before you decide on what you want to print. For that you're going to need what's called a slicer. Now a slicing program turns an STL file into instructions that can be read by a 3D printer. So in the same way that you can't ordinarily just jam a sheet of paper into a paper printer, it needs drivers to tell it what to do. A 3D printer can be from almost any manufacturer, and each of them has slightly different requirements on what it needs to hear from your computer in order to print that miniature. Now there's all kinds of freely available slicing software online, but for our purposes we're going to use Cheetubox. Now as well as Cheetubox, there's also other programs like Lychee Slicer or Prusa Slicer, but Cheetubox is the one I got started with, and it's pretty widely used. It's also updating all the time with new features, which is really nice, and like I said, completely free. Now this is the main UI for Cheetubox, so when you first open the program, this is what you'll see. What we've got to do now is open up our file. So we'll go up here to Open, and of course you navigate to wherever you've saved your STL files. I've got mine all prepped up here. So I'm going to select the hazmat body helmeted, and I'll also select the other parts of the miniature, and we'll open those all together. Easy as. Now select all of those, and just drag them into the center of my build plate, which is describing the physical presence of the build plate in our machine. So as you can see, there's a lot of printing space I'm not going to use if I just print this one miniature, but for our demonstration this will be fine. Now earlier when I mentioned supports, why they're important is because of how resin printing works. When we first start up our resin printer, these first layers are deliberately thick and chunky to give the miniature something to stick to on the build plate. As each successive layer is applied by the 3D printer, you'll see this shape slowly grows. And if we scroll up a little further to later in the printing process, 
Here's a good example of what's called an island. Let's zoom in here. Now you'll see this big chunky support in the center is connecting to a part of the miniature which isn't connected to anything else yet. So if we didn't put a support there, it would simply be floating in open space, not connected to anything. That's going to result in a very poorly shaped print, probably even a failed print, because all of this stuff, if it's left floating around in the tank before it's connected to the rest of the miniature, at this point, you're going to have a disaster on your hands. So as you can see, this big chunky support in the center gives us plenty of grip and make sure that that will come off the printer properly. And as well, it's going to provide an anchor for the rest of the miniature as it prints. So one thing to bear in mind when you're doing your supports is that all of these little islands, like this one here, need to be supported. Otherwise, they are going to result in failed prints. That's pretty much how a 3D printer works. It's kind of similar to an MRI machine and how that individually images slices of a three-dimensional object. For a further demonstration, I'm going to click here, Settings. Now you'll find that most 3D printers are covered by the default settings in Cheetobox. If you do have an unusual machine, well, there's setup guides for that if you need them. But I figure if you're just getting started, there's a pretty good chance that your machine will be in this list here. Now what we're most interested in is this tab here, Print. And this is going to give us all of the physical characteristics of our 3D print. Now there's two most important details when it comes to printing. And that is here your layer height and your exposure time. Layer height is literally how thick each little slice of the miniature is going to be. And generally speaking, the lower the layer height, the smoother the end result is going to be. I normally print mine at 0.4 millimeters. It's normally good enough for what I want to do. If you do want extremely nice and smooth miniatures filled with detail, print smaller. Your manufacturer will be able to tell you what the minimum layer height your machine is capable of. And then the other detail we need is exposure time. Now when our printer is doing its thing, it's shining a UV light on a bottom layer of uncured resin, and essentially hardening it. The longer we expose that to light, the firmer and thicker that layer is going to be. If you expose a layer for too long, you'll get what's called bleed, and your detail is going to be soggy, it might even fail to print entirely. There is normally a sweet spot. You can use your manufacturer's guide as sort of a suggested starting point, although there is a lot of good information online, either through Reddit or Facebook. If you've got a commonly used machine, you'll ordinarily find somebody's already done the heavy lifting for you. For our print though, what I'm going to do is set it to 0.04 millimeters or 40 microns and my exposure time is 2.2 seconds. Now that might not seem like a lot, but there are two kinds of resin printing machines ordinarily. Ones which have a traditional RGB or color LCD screen in the bottom of the vat or those which have a monochrome screen or simply called mono. Now a monochrome screen is able to filter more of the UV light where it needs to go, so exposure time is much shorter. If you're printing with a traditional RGB machine, it'll normally be an exposure time of sort of between 8 to 12 seconds, depending on what kind of resin you're working with. But I know my machine, so I'm satisfied with this. I'm going to go ahead and close this, and then click Slice. That'll then bring us to this preview page, which is actually super useful. If you set the correct price for the resin that you've purchased, you can actually get a really accurate estimate of how much this print will cost. So by the time I've finished pulling this guy off of the build plate, cleaning him up, he'll have cost me 10 euro cents. Not a bad run. Now as well, there's this large black screen here. And what this is showing us is each layer that's going to be projected onto the build plate. So if I scroll all the way back to the beginning here, Let's imagine that this is the bottom of our resin tank. What's happening is every single one of these white blotches is an individual image that's being projected onto the bottom of our build plate. And over time, as you can see on the left there, that's going to create our three-dimensional object. Pretty cool. Now in a nutshell, that's everything you're going to need to know to get started on the digital side of printing basically how a slicer will tell your 3D printer what to do with that. Let's quickly click back 
And there are just one or two other details that I want to quickly point out, which, if you're just getting started, might be useful to know. Now, lifting speed is how slowly, or how fast, the build plate is going to be lifted up from the screen at the bottom of the tank each time you've completed a layer. Generally speaking, slower is better. The default on this tends to be around 60 millimeters a second. For our bottom layers, that's not going to matter. That's ideal. I do my lift speed around 40 millimeters a second. Some I know do it even slower, down to 25 or 30. It's a matter of playing with your settings and seeing what works best for you. Now, bottom layer count. Let's close this for a second. The bottom layers are these ones down here, which are first stuck to the build plate. These, you'll notice by comparison, have an extremely long exposure time. Now that's to make sure that they're good and stuck to the build plate. Because if they don't stick, you're going to end up with chunks of, well, broken miniature in the bottom of your resin. That's no good. 30 seconds is generally pretty good for a mono machine. But my original Alugu Mars, I was using a 60 second exposure time for my bottom layers. So that's that. All I need to do now is to save this to a USB drive and then take it on over to my printer. Once I've got it started up, in about three hours, I'm going to have a miniature. But there are one or two things we need to then do with that miniature before it's essentially safe to handle. Now, resin itself is a toxic substance, so it's not something to be taken lightly. We're going to use gloves, we're going to use some isopropyl alcohol, and we're going to use an awful lot of kitchen towel just to keep our workspace clean. But I'll show you that in part two of this guide. Now, as always, if you do have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments box below. You'll also find that Reddit and Facebook are really good places to go looking for resources from folks who might have had similar problems if this just isn't working for you for some reason. But in any case, this covers part one of our guide. So I'm going to go ahead, pop this bad boy on the printer, and see what we get in about three hours. And while I'm waiting for that to print, I'm going to double check whether or not there's any additional parts that I might have missed from my collection.